Welcome to another edition of CHP Talks. Our topic is the Supreme Court of Canada on trial, and we're here with Dr. Charles Lagosi. Rod, do you want to give him a, a proper introduction? Yes, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Lagosi with us today. Uh, Dr. Charles Lagosi was born in Brantford, Ontario, and he attended the North Park Collegiate and Vocational School, where he completed four years of high school in three and graduated as an Ontario scholar. He attended the University of Western Ontario, where he completed two years of social science studies towards his honors Bachelor of Arts degree and was named to the Dean's Honor List for both years. Dr. Lugosi was then admitted to law school at Western at the age of 20, one of the youngest in his class. Dr. Lugosi has been licensed to practice for over 39 years, almost 40 years, not just in Ontario, but British Columbia and in the United States, including the United States Supreme Court. Dr. Lugosi has authored three pro bono amicus briefs to the US Supreme Court and significantly contributed to a fourth. He's also appeared as a lead counsel in several important cases in the Supreme Court of Canada. And in recent years, one of his efforts has been uh, directed to Mary Wagner's case, which we're going to talk about today. So Dr. Lugosi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We uh, really appreciate your willingness to take the time. Thank you for that kind introduction. So our topic of today, the Supreme Court, uh, isn't just chosen out of the blue. It's chosen in connection with a specific case, as Rod mentioned, uh, dealing with Mary Wagner. And uh, Charles, are you willing to um, give us some background, some understanding as to what has brought us here today? What has brought us here today is the court's uh, refusal uh, to hear the case of Mary Wagner on the merits. And a decision was released around the 18th of February uh, where the court did not give any reasons. We don't know who the three judges were that refused um, the um, gateway to have this case heard by the Supreme Court. Uh, but the end result that this is the end of a legal battle that began in 2012. So there's been a lot of time go by, a lot of effort, and a lot of public support, uh, both in prayer and financial donations to make this all possible. On one, one perspective is uh, that there's a big disappointment in terms of the outcome that um, the strategy that we had to force the court to decide whether or not an unborn human being was recognized by the court as an unborn human being, or whether the court would um, uh, view the fetus as simply a part of the mother's body. And, and the court just refused to get involved, letting uh, keep in place um, the uh, the existing law of abortion on demand right up until the time of actual birth. So in one sense, people look at this as a defeat, but I think what's important to understand is that this is a, a victory. It's a victory because we established a significant record of what the truth is. The evidence is there. The law is there. We met the legal test for the court to permit this case to go forward. And so, if anything, it was the court itself on trial because the court has a responsibility to be faithful to their own test for leaves to appeal. And the court has failed that test. And so it reveals, in the end, more about the character of the court uh, than um, the merits of the case. And so in a sense, it's a very strong moral victory for us because we were all witnesses for the truth. We conducted ourselves with great civility, humility, ability, and put forward the compelling legal arguments that the court 
had it heard um, the full case, the court, in keeping with the principles of integrity and morality, would have had no choice but to recognize the unborn human being as a as a fact would have declared section 223 of the criminal code to be unconstitutional and from that point onward any abortion in canada would have been considered under the criminal code as a homicide in effect putting to an end legal abortion and making abortion illegal and so the court could see this would be the end result. And for reasons known only to them, um, they didn't want to deal with this issue. Okay. And that's uh, that's, so Charles, maybe just for, um, most of our uh, listeners would be familiar with Mary Wagner's story that uh, she would go into abortion clinics. She's done more than once and uh, presented roses to the women waiting uh, in the waiting room and prayed for them and offered them an alternative uh, to, uh, you know, the having their child killed in the womb. And, and the basis of the case, if I understand it correctly, is that under Section 37 at the time, uh, the law would permit someone, said it would, would not be a fence if you used even force, uh, of course, she only used words, she didn't use physical force, but even up to the use of force to protect anyone who was in imminent danger of an assault. Is that, is that sort of the gist of it? Uh, yes, because of Mary's history, she was under a probation order not to go to abortion clinics. And, and, and by being at an abortion clinic, going into a waiting room, talking with pregnant mothers who are waiting there for their turn uh, to have an abortion, um, uh, Mary was charged with interfering with the business of an abortion clinic, there, thereby committing the offense of mischief. Now, um, she was ultimately convicted of breach of probation and the offense of mischief. But Mary had a very sound legal defense. At that time, in 2012, Section 37 of the Criminal Code had what's known as a defense of a third party. In other words, uh, Rod, if I'm walking down the street and I see Peter, uh, who's in on this conversation, uh, being assaulted by somebody, I could intervene, even if Peter were a stranger to me, I could, in effect, place him under my protection, even him as a stranger, to prevent uh, an eminent fatal assault upon Peter. And I'd be considered a hero for doing that. And and so uh, it's, it's basically protects a good Samaritan who comes forward and uh, does the right thing. I mean, but it's not against the law to watch Peter get beaten to death. Hmm. But it gives me legal protection uh, because if I exercise any degree of force, whether it's words or physical force against the people who are assaulting Peter, it gives me a legal defense to any charges they might want to lay against me for interfering with them in the process of harming Peter. And so that section of the criminal code uh, had its wording changed after 2012. So Mary relied upon the window of opportunity provided by the words any one. And logical common sense dictionary meanings of the words any one means any human being. That is the logical understanding. And so uh, we, we examined that word or those that, that concept very carefully and said, fine, to be a human being, it doesn't matter if you're waiting to be born or a human being after you're born. You're still a human being. Right. And so... 
uh, you're a human being, scientifically speaking, from the moment of conception. You're a, a completely new entity with your own DNA, with your own um, uniqueness. And if you're undisturbed, permitted to develop naturally in the natural order of things, you actually become recognizable as the human being you are today. And so Mary says in court, I am the rescuer. I am, well, she didn't call herself the hero. She's far too humble to call herself. I know. Yeah. But the point is this, is that she was there to save the lives of, I think, a dozen babies that were about to be killed on that fateful day, August 15th, 2012 in Toronto. And so she, she went there and her, and rather than using physical force, she used love as her force, love in action by using words, by offering a gift of roses, by giving information that there'd be financial support and other support so that there will be no hardship for these pregnant mothers to have so that they would be provided for if they chose to have uh, their baby. And so for her efforts, she was rewarded with criminal charges. And, and then I think I need to answer the other part of your question. What happens since 2012? Well, the conservative government was in power um, and they decided to reform the criminal law. They retained the third party defense, but now removed the word anyone and substituted the word person instead. And as you know, there have been cases decided by the Supreme Court of Canada uh, on the meaning of person. And person is of course, is a legal fiction. You can be a person with all the legal um, bundle of rights that attach to a person um, if you're born alive and then you become a person. But the reality is before you were born alive, you're still a human being. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, there's a big distinction between the two. Now, um, a case based upon the new version of what used to be Section 37 on person would have great difficulty, if not an impossible burden, because the Supreme Court has very much settled the law that to be a person in law um, as far as human beings are concerned, you have to be born alive. And now, the Supreme Court can, of course, um, come to a different interpretation if Parliament uh, decided to say you're no longer a legal person if you're in a coma or if you're over the age of 90. And as you know, history tells us genocide can happen when based upon race, mm -hmm. a country may decide uh, that Jews are no longer persons in law. Right. Um, and that's where we get into trouble, where you have political agendas that declassify human beings as persons. And so no murder laws are broken when the government enables what would otherwise be mass murder to be legalized mass murder, uh, which gives immunity to the people who commit these atrocious acts. So th that's the one thing. And, and I believe it's kind of interesting that in Canada, we've now designated a river in Eastern Canada to be a person with a bundle of rights. Well, wow. I've just read that in the news within the past few days. 
And so if a river can be a person, I, I would suggest that members of the ape family are not far behind mm. where gorillas can be persons or maybe your, you know, your favorite pet cat or pet dog can be legal persons with bundles of rights. Or old growth forest trees in British Columbia can be designated as persons. And so we avoided the whole personhood argument. I mean, the American approach is entirely different. In the United States, um, the uh, 14th Amendment, which is different from Canada's constitution, uh, ties into personhood. And personhood attaches uh, at the moment of conception in the United States. And the court, a court can so rule if they're inclined to do so. Whereas Canada, we tend to split the concepts. Uh, so, so I think it's important to appreciate the distinction, but, but that's why Mary's case was so unique. It was a, it was a very limited window of opportunity um, to establish the self-defense of others provided that the court agreed with us that the unborn were human beings. Now, here's the problem we ran into. And, and, and section 223 of the criminal code, which is in the homicide section, says, you are not a human being until you are born alive. Mm -hmm. and, and so... We couldn't just argue Section 37 as it then was because the criminal code would most likely have to be read as a complete code, as a complete scheme. And that being the case, um, we have to challenge the constitutionality of Section 223, which, which says you're not a human being unless you fulfill these two con conditions. Now, if you step back and think about it for a second, where does Parliament get the authority to decide who is and who is not a human being? How, how can they have that sort of power? Where is it in the Constitution that grants the power to the Supreme Court of deciding who is and who is not a human being? So if the court can say, um, that you're not a human being until you're born alive, then the court can also say you're not a human being until the age of two. Or you're not a human being until you're 10 years old. Or you're not a human being if, if doctors declare you to be in vegetative state. Or you're not a human being if you're African-American or First Nations, or whatever criteria they want to apply. Now, some of these criteria, you may think, it's ridiculous. It'll never happen. It's ludicrous to go down such a slippery slope. Yeah. But who would have anticipated that the greatest killer of human life ever since humans came into existence would be abortion. Yeah. Who would have anticipated that? Who would have thought in another era, in another culture, even a hundred years ago, that, that children waiting to be born would be victims of legalized mass murder? Yeah. And so, I mean, it's unimaginable, I would suspect. I mean, normally people would be thrilled to have a child. They'd be honored, privileged to be parents and so on. But in, in the culture that, that is prevalent in Canada today, um, there is a, a, a deep division between people who want a child and people who don't want a child. And if a child is unwanted, they are given the arbitrary um, discretion to kill legally a helpless, innocent human being who's done no wrong. 
you know, we we all are obsessed with fair trials, due process. But here you have people who hold the power of life and death over an innocent human being who's powerless, helpless, vulnerable. And one might argue that this has got to be the ultimate child abuse that ever existed where one could do that with immunity, legal immunity, and have no repercussions other than perhaps psychological um, down the line or um, and, and, and these kind of consequences. But there are no legal consequences. So the law permits this. And so, uh, you know, I mean, just think of it this way. Um, at one time, men had a superior legal position over women. Women had an inferior legal position. And women demanded equality. And you know what? I'm, yeah. I'm very glad women now have equality. I think that's, that's the right thing. And, but the irony is women who now enjoy equality with, with men they are in a superior position to another inferior class, the unborn human being. Right. And they are ex exercising the same kind of dominance. And worse, because when men were in a legally superior position to women, if they killed a woman, they'd still be accountable. Right. It'd still be murder. But if now a woman decides to kill an innocent, vulnerable human being who's not yet born, um, there's no accountability. I mean, it, 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 that's, that's the ultimate irony here. Yeah, really sad. And so Mary in love and out of a sense of responsibility has decided to take action. And we worked together to try to reform the law. And that's why Mary's case was a test case. It was different from all the other times she went to court. This is the only time this kind of an argument was raised. Mm -hmm. and, and it won't be possible again in the future. But we established through the law that there was only one possible answer, and that was the unborn are human beings. The unborn as human beings would fit within the definition of individual in section 15 of the charter. The unborn human being uh, as, a, as an individual would fit within the definition of everyone in section seven of the charter. So these section seven and 15 rights would be paramount to any other rights um, for anyone else. And that's, I believe, what the court didn't want to touch at all. They didn't want to go there because they knew if they went there, intellectual integrity would demand that 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 Mary would win her case. Well, that is a yeah, that's a phenomenal um, point uh, to make. The uh, the logic of the argument is such that, as you said, the court was on trial in terms of its own its own honesty, its own integrity, and and as you pointed out, it's it really failed that test. Do you think this is another case, another instance of, of judicial activism? Well, activism can be can be interpreted to mean doing nothing to keep a status quo. Yes. Uh, so I think it, it's it's a reasonable interpretation that it's it's one form of judicial activism to do nothing. Um, so I, I think uh, I, I think a commentator uh, could make a reasonable argument that this is 
um, wrong and 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 that the court had other options available uh, to be transparent because transparency requires I believe the presentation of arguments on both sides a fair hearing uh, deliberation without bias without prejudice and faithfulness to the law and faithfulness to the constitution I think that's what was required and and I think as a law professor for a number of years, you know, it's going to be difficult if I ever return to the classroom and to explain the reasoning of the court, because the one question a student may ask would be, well, professor, the law to get leave requires that the legal issues be fundamentally important questions that have affect the entire nation. How is it that the question of abortion fails that test? Mm. How, how is it? I, I mean, I, I mean, the court grants leave in matters far less important, far less fundamental, and and, uh, and so to have confidence in the court, to have consistency in the court, to have faith in the court. I think the court needs to be uh, consistent in its application of the leave test. I don't, I, I otherwise, um, I think that the people who watch the court will speculate and portray the court in a negative way that is, that is unfortunate. That is unfortunate because I think we all want to honor the court. We all want to respect the court. We all want to acknowledge that these are the greatest legal minds that we have in this country and that we have faith in their integrity and that we have faith in justice. But when a case like Mary's comes along, many people in the pro-life community have indicated to me that they have lost faith, that they don't believe in just in the justice system, and that um, they're so uh, disappointed and and just cannot trust the people on the court anymore, which is which is a situation of the court's own making. I'm afraid, you know, the court has to be responsible for that. You know, I mean, the court could have heard the case and maybe dismissed the case in the end for for reasons that are fair and proper. Uh, they might say, for example, Section 37 is no longer the law, and so maybe the case is moot. They could maybe make an argument like that. Or they could say, well, uh, yes, they're human beings, uh, but um, it's not up to us to um, decide what the future of abortion is going to be. It's up to Parliament. All we can do is strike down Section 223, give Parliament a year to come up with something. They could have done something like that. There, I mean, the court had options available to it. I mean... An activist court the other way might have said Section 223, which gives Parliament the power to define who is a human being, is clearly not within pow Parliament's power. You are a human being because you exist as a human being. It's a natural state that cannot be um, pronounced to be otherwise because it's be useful to say... Um, Unborn human beings are not human beings because the truth must be prevail. And and the, the role of the courts is always to search for the truth and to proclaim the truth. And so uh, the court may have said that and said, okay, um, 
the question is under section 37 does does mary fall within section 37 okay anyone includes a human being but then they could have said but um can mary place an unborn child under her protection they could they might be able to say well maybe legally she could not place them under her protection or maybe the force of words is not sufficient maybe she has to do physical force to qualify under section 37. so there were numerous ways along the path that the court could have gone um, but the court was simply not willing simply not willing to do so and but I, I, they chose the they chose the, what Ron Gray, former leader, has called the coward's way out. They just avoided the question. They uh, were not willing to go on record publicly with that. And it appears that the uh, Parliament has joined them in their uh, efforts to evade that question by by preemptively changing the wording of uh, Section Thirty Seven. Uh, going back to under Mr. Harper's uh, leadership. And so uh, it's, it's quite, quite sad that a question like this of such monumental impact uh, doesn't actually see the, the light of day and, and public, uh, public discussion, public commentary, but is simply swept under the carpet. Well, I, mean, I think, I think there is another perspective. I, I, I think journalistic license is given to Ron Gray to say what he believes is is true and correct. I think uh, another another perspective might be to say that the court was brave, knowing it would take a lot of heat for this decision. The court was brave, knowing that it might be called cowardly by people like Ron Gray the court was brave because it stood for Morgenthaler uh, decision and uh, legal abortion on demand up, up, up until including birth. And one might say the court was brave to defend the status quo and that it, it knew that uh, other people in the community who were angry at the court might try and bring ridicule upon the court and so one could make the pitch that the court was brave for standing up for women's rights. I mean, look at it this way. Uh, you've got uh, six to three conservative type judges on the U.S. Supreme Court. Roe versus Wade is in jeopardy of being overturned. And, and, and the Canadian court has chosen deliberately not to go down that same path as the U.S. Supreme Court will likely go. <clears throat> as even with President uh, Biden reversing President Trump's pro-life measures, um, the court is still staunchly conservative. There is such a groundswell of pro-life support right through the whole United States. Uh, you have individual states protecting unborn human beings and I, I think that the court recognizes that movement to make abortion illegal again. And so from that perspective, the court is making its position known. And so it's not necessarily being neutral. It's taking a, a very strong advocacy role in defending the status quo by simply blocking what would have been a touchdown in the normal course of events. So Charles, Canada's uh, Supreme Court uh, has a quite a bit different makeup than the current U.S. Supreme Court in terms of uh, political leanings. Uh, can, you want to comment at all about how justices are appointed, how, you know, how we get the flavor of Supreme Court that we have today, uh, just briefly? Well, I don't have any insider knowledge as to the appointment of judges, but I can tell you one thing. As long as the liberal government is in charge, I will never be appointed to the Supreme Court. 
I can say more that with confidence. <clears throat> More's the pity. Uh, but but uh, uh, the reality is is that there is, there is uh, a desire uh, to to have an ideology that's compatible with the government in charge, and and uh, for for this reason, um, uh, people uh, are well aware in the legal community that that um, merit alone will not get you a judicial appointment uh, okay. and um and uh, and mer merit and integrity uh uh should be probably the the sole considerations but in this country language ability is important to be bilingual um uh, predictability is important in terms of their ideology um coupled of course with uh higher than average uh, ability higher than average um intellectual capacity but um uh, but i think that unfortunately um there is a political filter um, in judicial appointments that lawyers believe is real. And, and so um, that's, of course, regrettable. Um, I mean, in some places uh, in the world, judges are elected. But again, that process is fraught with difficulties, too. So it, it's, it's unfortunate. But but uh, we we it is what it is i think i think we need to recognize that and uh, unfortunately um uh, i i don't think anyone can point to the composition of our court as saying okay we've got five pro-lifers on there and and four people who are are not pro-life and so on but we weren't creating arguments that were pro-life or against life. We were simply advancing the law, the proper law, the constitutional law, the, the law of the country. We have we are we were on firm rock. Um, our arguments were very solid based upon law. So it was not pro-life rhetoric or anything like that. It was not an appeal to emotion or uh, anything like that. It was based upon reason. It was based upon precedent. It was based upon the Constitution. And, and that's what makes it even more disappointing, I think, for, uh, for people, because we uh, uh, advanced Mary's case with dignity and with um, uh, propriety throughout. And so, in the end, we can hold our head up high, we can put our heads on our pillows, we have a clear conscience, we've established a record, and, and part of that record is uh, what you have on your website now, I understand, um, the key legal documents that were uh, filed in the case. Um, we have a legal argument that was prepared for the Court of Appeal, which would have been very similar to the one we would have prepared for the Supreme Court of Canada. We have our application uh, for leave to the Supreme Court of Canada, which includes the two adverse judgments below and includes testimony from Mary Wagner and the will say testimony of the medical doctors and I particularly urge people to uh, not be intimidated by the, by the number of pages in that document, but zoom in on the transcript of what Mary Wagner says. I think her testimony is extremely, extremely compelling and very moving and very powerful. Uh, so I urge people to, to look at that. 
Um, and but for the future, the legal arguments um, and the response of the Crown is in there for the leave application. But I, I believe that we've now established a, a blueprint for a future generation of lawyers to, uh, to learn from our arguments and make them even better. So we have left a legacy behind that others can pick up on. And so I'm happy to have done that. Well, thank you so much for your time this evening, Dr. Lagosi. Uh, we're, we're certainly at our time and uh, must wrap this up, but uh, it's been great to hear you expand on all these things. Your earlier remarks about uh, personhood and about uh, the size of a person uh, made me think of another doctor, Dr. Zeus, who's uh, also under trial, it seems, these days. And his famous quote, a person's a person no matter how small. And uh, I wish that were so in Canada. And uh, may it be so as we continue our struggles in the political and legal fields. So, Well, thank you for drawing this to a close. You remind me of Mr. and Mrs. Potato Heads, who are no longer Mr. and Mrs. Potato. They're just potatoes. So, I mean, we our, our society is definitely different than when we all grew up. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, um, the two of you are bringing important issues uh, to, the, to the public. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to have uh, answered your questions. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, uh, Thanks again. <clears throat> We probably will have more questions in the days ahead. So, and I know you're continuing this, uh, this is uh, a bump in the road or even as you termed it a victory uh, in exposing the court uh, for what it is, but, but you have other cases that you're working on because uh, you're not uh, a quitter. And thank you for your diligent work on this particular case since 2012 and for Mary certainly we appreciate her sacrifice her willingness to uh, be sort of uh, the person in the docket uh, to to still defending as she did when she walked into the abortion clinic uh, so so she was when she walked into the courts and into the uh, prison cells uh, she was defending the uh, unborn and so we thank both of you for your service well You're thank welcome. you all for sorry you're welcome. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we hope that you'll join us again for uh, next week for another edition of CHP Talks.